okay? Yep. Okay, good afternoon. Lovely to see so many of you here this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. These are very, very bright lights shining in my eyes. If I go a bit squinty, it's just because it's very bright up here. Um, absolutely delighted to be chairing this session today. Uh, my name is Nikki Oxall. Uh, I'm a farmer. Uh, I also work for Pasture for Life, and um, I'm a PhD researcher looking at agroecological transitions. And um, before we start um, with getting kind of underway with this with this session today. Um, I do just want to say that we were meant to be joined by Dr. Lizzie Rowe, um, who has done quite a lot of work around a good life uh, beef framework. And Lizzie also does a lot of work around uh, poultry welfare. Unfortunately, Lizzie wasn't able to be part of the panel today. Um, so it was originally meant to be four of us, but you've just got three of us. But hopefully, um, we will still be able to do justice to some of the work. That does mean that we're not going to be able to cover some of the academic underpinning work of the framework. Um, so this will be far more um, from a, a practitioner perspective, but also looking more deeply at the ethics of, of livestock. So um, yeah, hopefully, that doesn't mean you're all going to dash out because you've been duped into being here. Um, but I'm sure it's going to be a great session this afternoon. Um, just to also say that we are um, in a live stream session. So if I'm looking at my phone, it's not because I'm bored or that I'm tweeting. Um, it's because I have to keep an eye on it for questions that might be coming in uh, from the, those who are watching us elsewhere. Um, so yeah, that's, I think, everything. Um, what we're going to do is have three presentations. Um, from Mart and also from Rebecca and then I'm jumping in with the presentation as well uh, obviously like the sound of my own voice so thought I would chair and present um, and what we will do is eat after each presentation we'll open up for two or three questions then we'll move on and then at the end hopefully that will give us plenty of time for discussion debate and discourse around some of the issues that we're going to be talking about in this session today um, so, I think the best thing is for us to get started. We're going to start with Mart, so um, you're going to jump on the podium, and um, yeah, thanks ever so much. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here, and um, I hadn't actually heard of this conference before, but I have been doing a lot of ecological agriculture, as I call it, rather than agroecology's eco agriculture for many, many years, 50 years actually. My name is Mark Kylie Worthington and I'm an animal welfare scientist, a cognitive ecologist, which means I study the minds of animals, an ecologist, and I also run ecological farms where we put in into practice many of the ideas on food production and with sustainability and animal welfare as priorities for the last 45 years. This we've called ecological agriculture. Uh, next. Doesn't work. What? Ecological agriculture is defined, unlike many of these other terms that we hear, it's very awkward to know exactly what they mean, regenerative agriculture and rewilding and agroecology, because I'd never find a decent uh, definition. Anyway, I defined this some 50 years ago. The establishment and maintenance of an ecological self-sustaining system with low inputs economically viable farming system managed to maximize net production without causing long-term environmental changes while being ethically and aesthetically acceptable. Uh, there's lots of vague areas there, I'm very well aware. I've written about 100 scientific papers and eight books, including the results of our farms, which is in this book here, which is now out of print, but I think you can get it from uh, Amazon. And I've got another one or two for sale if anyone's interested. First of all, there's a fundamental conflict between animal welfareists and wildlife conservationists in how animal welfare and sustainably go hoof in hand. 
animal welfareists believe that the interests of the individual trump those of the species. Wildlife conservationists, that the interests of the species trump those of the individual. Both must be considered and different thoughtful solutions provided for each case. Animal welfare, first of all, I'll talk about that for a bit. Because it was agreed generally that non-human animals, at least, were sentient, animal welfare science from 1970 to 2000 concentrated on identifying and measuring mental distress and physical suffering, lameness, diseases, infertility, abnormal behaviours, etc., in animals under human care. Since then, positive welfare, how to provide a life of quality, not just avoiding suffering, and how to measure this has become important. The basic ethogram of how many species of hoofed animals organize their lives are known. We know they make choices and decisions, and that each species has a different mental life, that is, worldview or epistemology. As mammals, we have many mental attributes in common, but we also have some differences. For these reasons, my contribution to how to measure when they have a life of quality is to adapt the Human Bill of Rights, which measures freedoms. But for animals, what freedoms they lack, that is, how much behavioral restraint there is in different common environments in which they live. Here's a sample for hoofed mammals. You probably won't be able to read this table, but don't worry. Um, look at the bottom line, if you can possibly see it. Anyway, I'll point out the relevant points. First of all, the wild, which no longer exists, as all land is affected by human activities, indicates that it's not always the freest place to be and that areas under human control can be as free, if not freer, than the wild. If you look at the column one, that's the wild, and the next one down is large pastures, <clears throat> where you can see that it's quite possible to have a freedom score which is as low as the medium side, or lower than bad wild environments. Only if the nature of the environment itself imposes behavioral restrictions such as being tied up or restricted in crowded areas all the time, is it clear that it is the environment itself and not the way it could be managed that curtails freedoms? Thirdly, we cannot make judgments about the relative importance of different freedoms. Is sex more important than being able to move around freely or looking after your infant more or less important to another mammal than it is to me. Each non-life-threatening -thre freedom must consequently, consequently be given equal weighting until we know otherwise. Uh, I'm not sure what that is, but anyway. So should we use animals at all for food? To answer this, Everyone needs to know something about how the ecosystem that we depend on works. So we'll talk about sustainability of ecosystems. Before humans had the technology to seriously manipulate and damage the environment, landscapes were a tapestry of grassland, forests, marshes, bogs, and the rest, maintained by a host of species of hoofed mammals, rodents, reptiles, birds, insects, and their attending, attendant predators, with everything recycling and always changing. This is, ah, uh, okay, never mind. In the, 20, in the 20th to 21st century, humans lost the plot when it came to, un, to understanding biological processes, such as agriculture, and thought they could improve on the natural world. Technology allows any type of landscape or animal to be exploited. If a nuisance or not used by humans, then try to eradicate it. Loss of biodiversity is exponentially growing. And unless we do something about agriculture, 
it's predicted that all multicellular organisms may be wiped out sometime. But hoof mammals, like all others in the web of life, are crucial to the maintenance of such ecosystems. Firstly, because they're grass grazers or shrub browsers, they learn to choose which species to eat. By different me methods of cropping their desired food, they keep some species under control, which allows others to establish and flourish in the herb layer, shrub or forest. This results in changes in the distribution of forests, open ground, grassland, shrubs and wet areas, but not their extinction, unless the hoof mammals are too numerous and their population uncontrolled, which can become the case when all predators are eliminated or land managed for human profit. Uh, I don't know how we've got to that one. Let's see what we get next. There, that's one. Um, that's a, a, a picture in Zimbabwe showing in uh, the um, Zambezi Valley, which is showing the different sorts of vegetation which are managed basically by a dozen or two dozen grazing animals. This is Exmoor, which is a British national park. In the foreground, Brendan Common, which has managed to maximise sheep, cattle and pony production, red deer and fox hunting, and walking by tourists. And it's lost most of its woodlands. Some ecologists call it a wet desert. In the background, the same land has been drained, replanted and paddocked to maximise sheep and cattle production and eliminate other species. But the resilience of the living system continues to astonish. Even with such unfavourable management for decades, a few marsh orchids still survive. There's one that I managed to find. Secondly, another contribution to biodiversity by foofed mammals are their hooves. The weight, size and shape of different hooves have different effects on the sward. Some make indentations and provided their numbers and access are controlled, floral species and their accompanying insects and birds can recolonize the sward where the, the holes are created. Thirdly, hoof mammals are social in different ways and their social life affects the landscape where they live uh, whether, whether they live in large groups or small, where they choose to camp at night or siesta, where they drink, where they shelter from the wind, sun and snow, all has effects on how the ecosystem and what species flourish there. Modern agriculture worldwide is the greatest cause of reduced species diversity by cultivating and destroying indigenous vegetation, polluting land, water, sea, air, with chemicals, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, etc., tinkering with the genetic makeup of plants and animals, as well as contributing drastically to climate change. A natural ecosystem balances its energy, one calorie produced for one used, or it must change. The best that modern animal production can do is produce one calorie for every 15 used, for intensive pigs, that is and that without calculating the energy costs such as animal food production and transport, production and maintenance of machinery and buildings, ending up with a score more like one calorie produced for 30 used. The decomposition decomposers who recycle all waste are disappearing because humus levels are too low to feed them and chemicals have killed them. We've known the consequences of the agricultural industry since the 1940s when Lady Eve Balfour published The Living Soil and in the 1960s when Rachel Carson published his Silent Spring. Yet modern high input agriculture continues to march willy-nilly over the fundamental structure of living systems while selling itself as essential and the only way to produce enough food for humans. Industrial agriculture's devotion to trade, increased use of farm products, of off-farm products, increase in size and jobs, now, 
and jobs now at the factory bench rather than on the land to satisfy humans' excessive consumption is tolling the death chime to the living system that supports us far more seriously than climate change. All eight billion of us and rising cannot have motor cars, even electric ones, or meat once a day. Industrial agriculture's threat to the living world is as certain as that the dawn will come tomorrow. And there's a very good paper by Chris Rhodes in the Linnean Society published this year called Architects of the Future, if you want to see some figures on this. I'm not, I'm not bullshitting you. So how do we fit hoofed mammals back into the living system so they contribute to the reconstruction of a sustainable, biodiverse food system? Ensure their welfare is at least as good as when they were wild and make it economic. First, we must understand and act on the central problems. Firstly, the number of humans and their consumption must not continue to rise. Secondly, the number of animals raised in intensive units must be greatly reduced to benefit their welfare and sustain life as we know it. Thirdly, the amount of meat eaten and other animal products used will be reduced, but it is vital that some is produced to ensure the sustainability of our planet. Fourthly, all animals must take their original place in the ecosystem and contribute. Cellulose converters to graze and browse, scavengers, pigs and hens, to scavenge and recycle. We know that wild and most domestic hoof animals are able to look after themselves and reproduce without our help. We know ha that having more than one grazing species increases production because different species eat different things and we know how to provide a life of quality for animals which involves a lot more than just letting them graze. But what we're less clear about is how many of each species that particular area can sustain to maintain or increase its biodiversity. We need many more trials and much more research. Since we've often eradicated predators, we must control the population by harvesting some animals. There's already some evidence from various projects that this can be done. But we need more information on the effect of different numbers and species of animals and plants in different areas and how both rich and poor humans can and must control their own and their animals' numbers. We can retain or reintroduce various species of hoof mammals into large wild type areas. These can produce food and other animal products, be in the right number be in the right numbers and managed in appropriate ways to ensure that they do not suffer and their population remains sustainable to help retain other plants and animals and increase biodiversity. So that's one option, large wild type areas. Another option is the in by land. That's lower altitude, easier to cultivate, often with better soils. This land has been cleared, drained and irrigated to produce human food and other products primarily for monetary gain. The land is low in humus and becomes dependent on the application of fertilizers, pesticides and herbicides, as we all know. Omitting these and recycling animal and human waste can allow for a high net carrying capacity of grazing stock, which fit into arable rotations, so humans need to grain and vegetables. Carefully managed, it also allows woodland and hedges to flourish. Today, very little land is being so cultivated. The highest percentage of such organic type farming, so far that I know, is 1% of the farmers in La Drôme in southwest France. In Britain, it's something like 0.2% or something. I don't know, somebody I'm sure has the figures here. We will need a swift change to government grants because people farm the way they do because they're paid to and educate farmers to combine selecting old farm practices and values with the relevant new technology to many food production, to, to marry food production, biodiversity, animal welfare, and consequently sustainability. 
there are and should continue to be many different solutions, it's foolish to write more rules than compliance with those we have already recognised. Some areas may reintroduce European bison or deer, or rebreed aurochs or tarpans, use old or modern varieties of cattle, ponies, sheep and goats. Some may favour a management to, to maximise a particular flora, or f that's a mountain junction, or flora, or fauna, that's um, a chamois on our nature reserve in France. Some will concentrate on trees or pigs, wild boar, or deer. Some will restrict to traditionally wild, some traditionally domestic species and breeds. Different strategies are being tried out in large or small areas, which are organic, rewilding, regenerative farms. Ways of having hoofed mammals to increase biodiversity and produce animal products range through set stocking, rotational grazing, use of electric or technological fences, no feeding to forage feed, shooting to rehoming, no handling to cooperative handling, as well as welfare designed abattoirs. We have some pointers, but we need new ideas and much more information. On our ecological farm on Dartmoor in the 1990s, with no inputs, we supported one livestock unit per acre, including winter feed and fodder, and all animal freedom score about the same as the not difficult wild. And that's all written up in my book here. In France, we had 164 hectares of mountain nature reserve where cattle, horses and sheep were rough summer grazed among the wild boar, roe, hares and chamois. The species diversity in numbers increased that is, wild boar, roe deer, and chamois increased, and the orchids spread from 10 to over 20 species. And that's all been published. The most difficult animals, however, to fit into this system were, ironically, those that are most eaten, cheapest and most available, chickens and pigs, who compete for food with humans and use large amounts of energy, whereas grazers and browsers utilize cellulose and can balance their energy use with that consumed, if we let them. Everyone with any land can help increase species diversity by mixing indigenous with non-indigenous plants and animals. Here's a small area which has been planted with wild flower seeds, but also non-indigenous shrubs and daffs for food supply for different species. If we follow the rules, one day we might have non-human predators again in some areas as well, rather than just their images implanted, in this case, by a beech tree. Thank you. Thanks ever so much. Oh, is my mic working? Yeah, we're okay. Uh, thanks so much, Mart. Um, and I think, yeah, it was really great to have a sort of global flavour um, that you brought to that with examples from, from different places. I'm just having a look. We haven't got any questions that have come in um, from the live stream, but I will keep an eye on that. We are going to take a couple of questions within the room before we move on. So is there anyone who has a question based on um, the presentation? Come on, you've got to disagree. Oh, I think we've got, um, just wait for the mic. Keep your hand up so that um, Tegan can see you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, is that working? Perfect. Uh, do you have a view about Alan Savory's holistic grazing technique where he advises you to bunch uh, cattle or whatever, it is, whatever livestock to improve the environment? Some people think that bunching the cattle per se is not good for their welfare, but the advantages from Sabre's point of view are well worth any... I think mob grazing can be all right, <coughs> but it would depend a great deal on the size of the mob um, and the size of the pasture. Uh, for example, cattle tend to prefer to be in groups of... Um, and I'm talking about cattle tomorrow if you want to hear more about how they do things. Um, uh, they tend to prefer to be in groups of no more than 100. If you mob them together in groups of three or four hundred and they're very close pressed, 
then that's not going to do them any good and what you'll end up having is a whole lot of conflicts between individuals which will cause production to decline and all the rest of it. So, but it, a lot will depend on the environment, you know, how much grass is growing and this is what I'm saying is that we need, we need a hell of a lot more information on rewilding or, or grazing systems. I mean, yes, we've gone down certain certain routes up till now and the Grass and Research Institute at, that used to be in Hurley did a lot of research on using different species and maximizing uh, production and so on but you know time goes on and there's plenty more we need to do on how to do this in various areas. Thanks so much for that question and we've actually um, I think both uh, Rebecca and I will be picking up on mob grazing as part of our presentations. Um, any other questions in the room? Yeah, we've got a question. <coughs> oh, sorry for coughing on the mic. <coughs> Thanks. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned that the wild is not necessarily the freest, and I was hoping you could expand on that a little bit. What is not necessarily free? The wild isn't as free. Yeah, no, the wild isn't the best place in the world. I mean, if you're, in, if you're wild, you have a whole lot of possible things that can go wrong. Maybe they won't, but sometimes and quite often they do. You may starve, you may be eaten and chased by predators, you may die of thirst or not find enough, you may not have shelter, uh, and so on and so on. So say that the wild, then we need to put all the animals back in the wild, which doesn't exist anyway, because we've manipulated everything anyway, uh, is, doesn't add up. We've got to go on from there and realize that, well, actually, if we're going to provide a life of quality, we've got we've certain responsibilities towards even wild animals. You don't get treated for very common diseases in wild. You can, get, you can die of infections, which would be actually extremely easy to treat. Now, whether or not you treat those in the wild is up to, up to the project, and I'm not suggesting everyone should. But I think you need to justify what you're doing and why you're doing it, that's all. Um, and the, there will be hundreds of different ways of doing it, and let's hope there is. We need lots of diversity. We mustn't start making parallel lines. The only thing is that we need to make sure the animals aren't suffering where they don't need to. Brilliant. And we'll have one more question in the room and then we'll, we'll move on. There was a lady at the back. Oh, we'll come, we'll come back to the lady at the back at the end, sorry. Hello, um, in your definition of ecological agriculture, you talked about self-sufficiency. In that context then, if you're farming animals, hooven animals, do you think we have, can have systems where we buy no extra inputs, we solely regenerate from what we've got within the farm? Um, albeit we're selling animals or good, you know, nutrients, as it were, off the farm through our businesses. Yes, that's what we have been trying to do. We, we, Self-sustaining means that all products used by the animals are produced on the farm, and it's up to us if we want to feed them grain, then we must produce the grain to feed them. Um, and it's got to be economically viable, too, and it has been, you know. That's why I'm standing here and not dead as of uh, something or other, <laughs> lack of money. <laughs> um, it hasn't, doesn't make a fortune, but it can be self-sustaining. Now, I'm not suggesting that every farm needs to be like this, but I am suggesting that I think that we need to reduce trade so that where possible, we could make, we can model the farming system along the way ecosystems work so that we don't end up having importing food from, you know, organic uh, soya meal from the Amazon to feed our dairy cattle, organically. Nonsense, complete nonsense. You know, we need, we need to look carefully at where these products are coming from and how they're coming and what the net, net gain is and what the net cost is environmentally, and we don't. But we could. 
Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. I think we will come back to more questions in a bit. We haven't had any questions from our live stream audience, so if you're watching um, <coughs> elsewhere, please do put your questions in the chat and then we can, or in the questions box, and we can pick those up as we go through. Um, just a couple of reflections on that. I think it was really interesting, and the real sense that I got from your presentation was very much about diversity, about um, mosaics, um, and having you know, a, real, uh, a really strong mix of different types of animals, types of places, types of ecosystems. And, um, and I think that, yeah, it's a really fascinating um, sort of first step into this conversation is particularly through those wilder wilder landscapes, you know, recognizing that we don't necessarily have anywhere that is truly wild um, due to the, to the impact of, of the human hand, as it were. Um, we're going to move on and listen now to uh, Rebecca's presentation. Um, and, well, I'll let Rebecca introduce herself um, and really looking forward to hearing um, no, you're okay, don't worry. your perspective. Right. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just going to clear my throat before I start. I'm desperately not to try and cough on the mic. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, that's right, you can all cough now if you wish as well. We'll all clear our throats together. Um, so my name's Rebecca Mayhew, and I farm with my husband and family in Norfolk. Um, and delighted to be able to talk about a good life and how animal welfare and sustainability go hoof in hand. Um, now, as part of this uh, pre preparation for this, we were asked to think about um, the uh, productivity per acre of environmental footprint or hoofprint, as it were, um, and are we doing, for example, the right thing by using slower growing animals to feed ourselves? Should we be better to be more intensive and use more monogastrics? So what I'm going to do is talk you through our story, where we've, what we're doing now, where we came from, and then I'm going to throw some um, slightly provocative, but that's probably why I was asked, thoughts into the room for discussion. Um, Excellent, the green button works, which is brilliant. So, uh, about us, based in Norfolk, um, we currently have a Jersey dairy, um, calves at foot. Um, they stay with their mums until seven to nine months old. They're completely pasture fed. Um, but we used to traditionally be a very efficient, and you can put your own inverted commas there, um, very productive farm with intensive arable and indoor pigs. We don't do that anymore. We, We've been down that road, and it's exhausting. Um, yes, we grew a lot of food, but we also made a lot of money for the bank and probably nothing for ourselves. Um, but I will come back to that in a minute. So current use, um, a brand new dairy. We got our first cow six years ago, possibly seven years ago. Time's flying at a vast rate of knots. Um, and we fell in love with cows on holiday in Scotland, and we wanted to change the farming system very desperately. And it was literally, I fell in love with the jerseys um, and away we went with a little dairy and that changed the course of the farm completely. Uh, so we now have, um, obviously, our jerseys who are native breeds. We have rare breed cattle for beef, again, completely pasture fed. Um, sheep, I've finally been allowed sheep. They're a complete nightmare. But there we go. They're, they do work well in our farming system. Um, goats for meat and on-site experiences. Uh, rare breed pigs for meat, all soya free, and chickens for egg production, they are also soya free. And um, when they're not locked down, they are pastured, so they move around a lot, but they are currently miserable, um, which is an interesting question when we come back to animal welfare and bird flu and what on earth we're going to do to get ourselves out of that particular mess. Um, I don't know if you've heard anyone come up with some good ideas yet. I haven't. So that's a whole can of worms. We won't open that today. Um, so everything that we do now is direct sales. Um, before, we were all commodity, um, and I'll go so far as to say we didn't have anything to sell direct, because when you start talking to people about the system, there's not really a lot to talk about, um, and it's not something as appealing as what we do now, which is milk from our beautiful cows and all the various other products that we have. Um, so we currently now have a farm shop with butchery and restaurant, um, and because of the way we structured our business, our animal welfare is very much on show. We have an open gate policy, and the gate opens at half past seven in the morning, and if people want to come down and sit for two hours and watch us milk, then they can. I do ask that if people come before eight o'clock, they bring me a coffee, because I'm not always that sociable first thing in the morning. It's an interesting lifestyle choice to have milking cows, but there we go. Um, 
So really, really high level of public interaction and interest. And this is where I think the question of animal welfare and our diet and what we're going to do in regards to climate change and sustainability it is so, so interesting. Um, and it's essential to have that public interaction and that conversation because we can't, we, we farm because we're allowed to in many ways. Yes, we own land, <clears throat> but we, yeah, we, we farm with consent from the people that buy the food. So. so the dairy, I'll quickly skip through. I've got some nice pictures there. Um, 60 head altogether started with one in 2016. Um, calves at foot, as I've said, we milk once a day. Um, I was chatting to um, a dairy farmer who's very kindly come to listen. He's at the back and I said, I cannot contemplate doing the washing up twice a day, once a day for me. I'm not lazy per se, but by the time you've milked and done all the other jobs, the idea of turning around and milking again, um, so that it's just too much. So um, keeping calves at foot makes me happy, makes the cows happy, and it does mean I you know, can easily milk once a day and take some pressure off that way. Um, when we started up the dairy, when we got our first cow, um, my husband and I were sitting around the kitchen table and he said, because we hadn't completely formulated our business plan at that stage, he said, what on earth are you going to do with all this milk? I'm thinking butter, cheese, ice cream. Obviously, then I'm going to need to go to a gym because I'm going to be the size of a house. Um, and he said, well, of course, you know, what you have to do is you have to take the calf away and then you bottle feed it. And I thought, well, hang on a minute, that sounds like an awful lot of work. So I'm not actually lazy, but I'm quite practical. And I thought, well, how about we try and do something different? Because I don't like the idea of taking the calf away. It's just not me. So we gave it a go, and we stuck with it. And if we had to change all of our business, um, the only thing I wouldn't change would be that calf at fit element. Um, so we're raw milk, on-site processing, um, because of the way we treat the cows and the calves, we are able to charge more. The fact that we are completely pasture-fed, we are able to charge more. I mean, we are producing on a pasture-fed system in the summer when the grass is really good, say, we'll call it 10 litres per day per cow, over the length of the lactation. Um, because we're losing half to the calves, I charge twice as much. And we have that conversation with people, and they understand and they accept, and they can, they can understand the logic of that. But that's where I explain that animal welfare has a cost. And you either drive it down, and you drive down the cost of food, and the welfare goes with it, or you bring it all back up. And if you're having these, these interactions with people, that's where we really want to go. And that's where I get cross about bird flu, because I've already heard from the vets that they're saying we might not be allowed to let our chickens out this year. That's a big thing to think about, isn't it, in January already. And they were only out for six months last year. So we need, we need to look at things differently. Um, so we very much treat the milk as the opposite of what the dear old supermarkets would do. It's not a loss leader. It's really important for nutrient density um, and for us as, as humans. It's part of our diet. We've evolved with it. Milk is really important. <clears throat> and that pasture-fed element, of course, brings a completely different nutrient profile to the milk, which is incredibly important. Um, we do mob graze. Um, we were lucky enough to do a holistic management course um, so we use holistic plan grazing. Um, it just about saved us last year due to the lovely weather that we had. Um, we, I think our biggest mob is the beef herd, and they're 85, so we're keeping under that level of 100. Um, I can see how difficult it would be to manage them once you get over that, that level. 85's enough. I had stern words with them before we left yesterday, which was, the fence is on, you've been fed for two days, don't go anywhere. Haven't heard the phone ring, so we're assuming it's okay. And um, just going back to the value of, of cattle and animals in general, um, particularly during the lockdowns, because we have such an open policy with the farm, we found that quite a lot of cow therapy and goat therapy happened before we even realized what was going on, because people could come shopping. And they would come to the shop, and then they'd come and see the cows. And it's that interaction with people and their food and the animals that help produce the food that is, is so crucial. So animal welfare for them and for us and bringing them into that conversation about food and diet and farming in general. So why jerseys? They're short, I'm short, it's perfect. I can't be milking something that's this tall. Um, so rare and native breeds only. Um, our first cows had continental cross balls over them, so that means they're like a big Belgian blue or British blue. We had so many calving issues. Um, 
I know they're jerseys and they're very good at carving, um, but it felt at the time that it was very stressful. So from a, a welfare point of view for us, we've gone down the rare and native breed route. Um, so they are slower growing, which I accept, but then also means they have a life. And there's a whole conversation there about eating something that's been forced, that's been pushed, that's been rushed. And that's what we used to do with the pigs. You know, they'd be born and out the door before they were seven months old. So wh where's the... But where's the life, where's the flavour, where's the nutrient density? And particularly if you've got an animal that's eating a high grain and a high soy diet, even if you've grown that grain at home, which we, which we did, it's not the same product. So it makes me very nervous when people, and we are hugely criticised by sometimes my father. He's never farmed, he has no idea. So I hope he's not watching. No, he won't be, it's fine. Um, so, but other people as well, and other farmers, but we are not as productive, or not seen to be as productive as we used to be. But we feed more people than we ever used to be. We used to feed the supermarket. I'm not proud of that. Um, we fed that big machine, you know, that just, that conveyor belt. Um, and that's what we want to get away from. Which is why we've got these beautiful cattle. Um, and dual purpose animals is something that I'm very, very passionate about. So, we all know that dairy calves used to be shot at birth, the bull calves. Why has that changed? Well, the public found out about it. Would it have changed otherwise? Question. So that's me being slightly provocative. Um, so we use a lot of dual purpose um, breeding with the cows. We do have a bull, uh, which we've got more than one bull, um, but we're also using red poles, so we can either have a good meat or milk animal. We've got dairy shorthorns, northern dairy, northern dairy shorthorns, Irish moils, and they're beautiful. They suit our environment. They weather well. I mean, I love my jerseys, um, but they're possibly, um, they could be a little bit more robust, so we're trying to bring other genetics back in. And yes, they're slower growing, and no, they're not theoretically as productive as these um, huge great black and whites, but wow, they are really rugged. Um, so we also, as I mentioned, the lovely sheep. So we have the lovely sheep as well. Norfolk Horns, South Downs, Herdwicks, goats, um, all pasture fed. Um, I can't bring myself to feed cake. I just can't do it. We're talking about energy efficiency and, and Mark was bringing this in. Um, if you think about the amount of energy that used to go into our pigs for the calories that came out, it doesn't work. If you look at bags of salad and how far they've traveled and the energy that, go, that goes into making that, you know, talking about, about hundreds of calories for an 80-gram bag, bag of salad, probably thousands, actually, if you think about the, the fuel and the plastic and those being shipped all over the world. And th these are serious questions we have to ask ourselves, and it's really good to hear Mart talk about the conversation about rising population. Should it? I said provocative. I'll move on. Um, so chickens and pigs, soil-free again, and we're trying to vertically stack enterprises on the farm. We are quite new at the whole agroecological agro movement and regenerative, you know, we've, we've made huge changes in a short period of time, but trying to make everything as efficient as possible. So the cattle get first pick of the grazing, and then the sheep will come across, and then we've got the chickens coming behind, and it's vertical stacking, lots of layers. You know, we're at the stage now where we do actually just about have enough cattle on 500 acres. We didn't before. And so it was just trying to be, as, again, as efficient as possible. But it's, it depends how you look at productivity and, and energy efficiency. Um, so I think I've probably covered all of those things. Um, you see the beautiful picture on the far right. That is, in the summer, what our cows eat in that bottle on the left. They eat flowers, and they eat pasture, and they eat trees. They browse. They teach their calves to browse. It's fantastic to watch them. Um, and you know, these calves are learning straight away. Um, lovely pasture-fed steak there. I mean, we, we are very, very lucky to have our own beef at home. Um, it's, it's not the same often if you are going out um, to a restaurant. Um, so we're very picky now, particularly now we have our own restaurant at home. Hardly ever go anywhere. So thank goodness that <laughs> events like this happen, so it's a good excuse to leave the farm. Um, so we're just trying to focus on the antithesis of what we were before. Um, health for us and the animals, something more natural, um, something more energy efficient. And our cattle, you know, we're talking potentially about having more monogastrics because they're faster growing and you can keep them inside and save land. Well, it's not right. It's not right and we've done that. And what ecological services do intensive pigs bring? None, they don't. They don't. So it was a really interesting question that we were posed by the, by the conference and 
I was partly, my heart was in my mouth going, oh, I hope people, obviously no one believes that here. But is, you know, there are, there are powers that be in the world, and are these things that they're thinking about? The answer is probably. You know, we're talking about fermenting bacteria to eat, aren't we, in factories? And these lovely vertical farms with ultraviolet light. That's not what I want my food to look like. So um, that's the picture at the bottom there of our, our cattle outwintering. Um, we've got 85 cattle. Obviously, they've changed slightly in their makeup because some move on. Um, but they haven't been in for two years, which is fantastic. So we're saving energy by feeding them outside, saving the straw. Yes, we have to move some bales around. Um, some of that is using diesel. Some of that is using mussels. <laughs> we're a lot fitter by the end of the winter than we are when we go in. Um, but we're you know, constantly thinking about their environmental footprint. And they just eat pasture and hay and straw bought from local farms. We aren't doing our own arable at the minute, but we will do again. So it's just trying to keep everything as close a loop as possible, you know, keep the poop in the loop, all of that. Um, but no, no slurry, we stay well away from that. Um, and we are what they eat. So talking to someone in the audience earlier about nutrient profiles and omega-3s and 6s, that's, that's so important. And the minute you start feeding grain, it's causing, causing problems. So these are some of the other questions I sort of wanted to, to throw out in the room generally and for discussion. So talking about productivity per acre of environmental footprint and why it's so important for farms to be as efficient as possible. Does anyone actually translate that if they're non-farming to their lives? They put all the onus on us as farmers and food producers to think about those things. So who defines these parameters? Um, why are they being limited to food production? Um, and you know, what else do livestock provide in an extensive system? And that is so important. Ecological services, ecological engineers, they're growing soil. Um, we can't say the same of intensive systems. And here's uh, one of my favorite things. I think, um, I think my husband said it first, so sorry, I'm stealing this, but you know, pollution contributes to GDP. <laughs> That's wrong. But you know, we have to think about it in those terms to understand how ludicrous our food system has become. So think about inputs and outputs, calories in in terms of production for calories out in terms of what we can actually eat, and nutrients and you know, animal welfare shouldn't be sacrificed for productivity. I suppose that's, my, that's my, been my takeaway as I've been thinking about our brief today. Um, I think that wasn't quite my last slide. So I've sort of taken you through what we do to help you understand our context and what I was thinking when I, when I saw the brief. So we started thinking about it from what makes us happy. I mean, yes, we used to sell a lot of pork. <clears throat> In hindsight, we were miserable. Those cows make us happy. You know, the fact I've been told so many times that you cannot keep cows and calves together at scale. Absolute rubbish. Um, you can't if you don't think about it in the right way, but you absolutely can. Um, pretty sure it used to happen. Um, can we save the world? Not on our own, but that's what events like this are for. Um, everyone's context is different, so whilst I have very strong opinions about cows and calves. You know, there is a growing, still a growing population to feed, so not everyone wants to do things how I do, and I completely understand that. Um, but it's what we can do with our circles of influence. Um, so no one size fits all. But we also do have to consider what makes the customer happy, the person who actually buys and eats the food. Does that matter? Well, I hope it matters to you, because I find it matters to me quite a lot. So I think. Um, I'll probably hand back to Nikki for questions, but I think I've probably gone round and round over the whole, should we intensify monogastrics and keep them in a shed? But um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully not. Thanks. I think that was it from me. Amazing. Thank you very much. Rebecca. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Do we have any questions for Rebecca? We'll come to the question. Uh, at the front here, if you just hold on and wait for the speediest microphone in Oxford to come down to the front. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, Jane Cooper, uh, farming uh, red breed sheep and poultry in Orkney. To answer some of your issues about avian flu, Scotland's done it differently, for which we have to thank Sheila Vaux, who is our Scotland's chief vet. Um, she has determined that biosecurity is what's important, so we have to keep our poultry in an enclosure 
enclosed area which can be a field as long as we are adopting biosecurity for anyone coming in and out of that field. And we have had to cull one or two cockles that were escaping. <laughs> And that has made a huge difference to our welfare. I mean, we t talk in terms of a dozen hens per acre because they are foraging. We had to lock them up when we were in a 10 kilometer zone. They were miserable, they stopped laying, and it cost us a fortune in feed, mm. which made me realize how much they actually eat on the fields, even in winter. Yeah. So that's, I think, England and Wales should be looking I to shoot. I completely agree. I think I might move my chickens to Scotland. They are miserable and suicidal. They Thank could you. Do contract grazing for chickens. I'm happy to do that. You could just send them up. No, absolutely fine. We can have some sort of exchange program. That's great. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. And we've got a question at the back. Uh, sorry, if you can just hold on for the mic. Thank you. Making you do some miles today. So there is a. I think somebody just. Uh, just yeah, that person who just waved there, and then we'll go. Then we'll go behind next. Thank you. Um. Hi, I'm Esther Harper from the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council. Um, I was fascinated in what you were talking about um, in terms of uh, cow with calf uh, dairy farming um, and um, how, how has cow behavior impacted uh, your breeding choices, if at all? Um, I'd be really interested um, in anything you might have to say about that. Uh, that is a really good question. Um, so in terms of cow behaviour, I suppose I'm quite lucky with my jerseys because they're very placid, very easy natured. Um, I've been told all sorts of things about cows. I'm new to keeping cows, so you know this was a bit of a shock to the system, a vertical learning curve. So I have been told that they would reject calves. I have been told that even that the heifers would reject calves so they didn't know what to do because they hadn't learned from anyone else. I've been told that established cows would reject them because they'd always had them taken away. I've been told that they would be aggressive. Uh, none of that's true. So um, I'm really lucky because the girls have helped us do it. Um, in terms of a behaviour for breeding, um, we do have a Jersey bull called Derek. Um, he's three. He is about to come and work in the herd for a period of time. Uh, they have a dairy, terrible reputation, dairy bulls, particularly Jerseys. Um, his behaviour will limit his stay. Um, but as in terms of... Um, for the, for the breeding of you know, dairy replacements and things, I haven't really had any issues that I've had to, had to think about. I've been really lucky. So whether that's just dumb luck or whether it's how they've been um, handled, I don't know. I mean, all I can say about established um, cows and how they've treated their calves in their first lactations with me, they were brilliant. It wasn't until I got into second and third lactation once they'd been with us and they were in a more established routine, they knew where the calf was going to be. I had no idea how much better they could be. Um, we had, I think, one who was tricky. She wanted to see the calf when she was being milked. Other than that, they've, they've been really good. So I've been, I've been really lucky. Um, but I, I do like the native breeds. Um, you know, they suit the landscape and they are on the whole very, very placid. Okay, we'll have one more question at the back. I think there was a hand there, and then we'll move on. We have had some questions on the live stream, but I'll come to those afterwards. Hi, I was just wondering, do you put your um, jerseys in in the winter? And if so, do you feed them with hay or silage? Yeah, they are in. Um, because we uh, were an arable farm that just transitioned to a grassland farm, we have nothing in the way of cow tracks. So they, they go out every couple of weeks, but no, they're in eating hay and haylage. Um, and if we don't produce it um, on farm, we do produce a certain amount. Last year, obviously, being really dry, it was uh, tricky. But we buy it as locally as we can, and only from people that we know don't use sprays, etc. Whilst we're not organic, we don't use any, any chemicals, anything artificial. And Rebecca, just because you mentioned the drought, and there was a question from the online audience. Mm -hmm. um, are you using multi-species grazing lays, and which species did the best in the drought? Oh, that's another good question. So uh, we have used Countryside Stewardship Scheme to help us transition the farm. Um, so we've got GS4, which is basically herbal lays. There's about 26 different species in that. Um, chicory does fantastically, as does the plantain. Um, it's got sanfoin and lucerne in there as well, and they didn't do as well the first couple of years. But interestingly, with the drier weather, I've seen more and more occurrence of them in the pasture. Um, so all the herbs do really, really well, all the broad leaves. I think when we go back into stewardship, um, which we, we will replace the scheme with something similar or the same, 
we'll be looking at the, the grass, grass varieties that are in there. I think the only problem with buying something that theoretically you should reseed completely every five years is, of course, that there's no incentive for the seed seller to have something with a lot of longevity because otherwise, where does their next sale come from? So, um, yeah, the legumes are fantastic. And one thing I would mention about behavior and feeding, uh, particularly in the summer, is that on the pastures, they've changed a lot over the years, but the pastures where we have got the most diversity, when the cows come in for milking in the morning, I have the best behavior. So to start with, where they had um, more of a, a monoculture with less diversity, they were rude and there was a massive difference and once we realized what the pattern was because if they'd come in off the herbal lays they were much fuller more satiated once we realized what that was we had to then try and alternate it the benefits of that are of course that you're then pooing seed from the lay back onto the monoculture so you're helping to seed it but that that was interesting from a behavioral and feed point of view amazing thank you right well i feel like i'm multitasking i'll run over do presentation <laughs> for questions so thank you for bearing with us whilst we are um one down in terms of our panel so um yeah i i thought i would um talk a little bit about uh what animal welfare and sustainability looks like on on our farm in scotland um and actually it's interesting it's quite sort of similar to what's going on in norfolk so um you know it is really interesting that there are these similarities um so I mean, we've talked about agroecology already. I feel like I've talked about agroecology a lot today. So I'm going to move on, really. But I think what is really important is that there is this aspect of, um, of kind of the ecology of the entire food system, ideas around justice. Um, and, and it's not just about what happens on the farm. It's about what happens elsewhere. And part of that, a very big part of that, is about who we are as farmers who our customers are and how they interact with us, which, which Rebecca talked about really uh, uh, eloquently. And I think there's also this crossover into Regen Ag where you know, livestock integration represents this opportunity that really enables nutrient cycling um, through natural processes. And it's kind of harnessing these natural processes that are really enabling us to shift towards more sustainable forms of food production and fiber production. So, um, Oh, I'm going to jump on through that. We don't have time for that. We'll carry on. So, <laughs> um, but as you'll probably notice, those of us on the, on the stage firmly believe that animals have a role in a sustainable farming future. Um, and, uh, you know, we're probably, well, Rebecca and I are a little biased, maybe, because we're both farmers and, and work for Pasture for Life. And Mark has farmed as well and, and, you know, is kind of thoroughly invested in her life through, um, through the, the, the study of animals. Um, so... And there is a question that has come through on the, on the live stream about um, veganism and, and approaches to different diets, which we'll pick up in the questions afterwards. But I suppose it's probably fair to say by the third presentation you've worked out, we're all pretty pro-livestock. Um, but it's our role as farmers to enact that future, that sustainable farming future, in a way that is ensuring positive welfare and gives all of our animals and our farmers a good life. Um, and that we don't sort of say, well, these ones over here can have a good life, but that means that these ones over here are going to have to be intensively reared. We have a responsibility as part of this broader community to support and enable and encourage others to consider how we can support these, the use of these frameworks, like the Good Life Framework, and thinking more broadly about, you know, would we want people to see this? And I think that point Rebecca made is, you know, is, is our open, is our gate, are our gates open to the public? And if not, why not? What don't we want them to see? So from a very practical point of view, I'm just going to talk about four things. Um, the diversity of pastures, silver pasture as a practice, adaptive multi-paddock grazing, aka mob grazing, aka holistic plant grazing, aka various other grazing types. Um, and also want to talk about family groups and natural weaning. So first off, in terms of grazing diverse pastures, um, Species-rich grasslands would be described as these open grassy habitats, usually with 15 or more plant species. And we are losing our species-rich grassland at a rate of not. So in order for us to ensure that we have environmentally positive, sustainable grassland system, systems, we have to make sure that we're integrating those with livestock. Meadows, for example, I just a pet hate of mine when you see a lawn called a meadow and it's never seen any sort of animal near it. You know, meadows are they are part of a farmed environment. And we used to historically have wilder species-rich grasslands that weren't part, of wild, weren't part of farm systems 
but there were ruminants present that would, that would kind of enable those types of habitats to be maintained. And we've, we've removed and changed the landscapes, as Mart said so much, nothing is, you know, has been, nothing is beyond our reach as humans. We've messed so much up that we have a responsibility as land managers to kind of recreate in some way some of these types of habitat. So the species richness, it's vital for pollinators, really important soil carbon stocks, and plant life have done some fantastic work on trying to understand what is the carbon stock below our species rich grasslands in particular. And I really recommend, um, there is a plant life stand out in the hall, so go and have a chat with the team out there if you're interested in that. And there can be a reduced need for bought in supplements, um, which obviously requires monitoring if you're feeding your animals on these very diverse pastures. And we've already heard again that that can contribute not only to improved quality of meat and milk, and we've got lots of research through Pasture for Life to demonstrate that, but also in, in how contented animals are. By having permanent pastures, we're reducing tillage and we're maintaining reductions in fossil fuels because we don't need to reseed these and there was a question earlier about you know can we have these circular farms on our farm in five years we've not had any inputs completely zero input and we're able to through our grazing management maintain high levels of productivity from the grassland whilst also maintaining high species richness and in terms of welfare this means that we have these com complex and diverse diets for animals you wouldn't want to eat the same thing every single day like just a bit of white bread every day, day after day for every meal. We like diversity in our diets and so do our animals. And we'll see that when, you know, looking at our cattle, they'll be out choosing and selecting different things to eat. It supports that balanced rumen function, this idea of a mixed bite. And I've used the word here, foggage, um, which is, anyone know what foggage is? No. Foggage could, it could include Yorkshire fog. Any other ideas on foggage? Yeah, brilliant, standing hay, yeah, excellent. So standing, sorry, I went into teacher mode then, didn't I? Standing hay, educator turned farmer. Standing hay, deferred grass, also known as foggage. I think it's a Yorkshire word, I think. Um, and so it gives this brilliant mixed bite. There's a mix of green, a mix of brown. It's really good for rumen function. So in terms of health and welfare, it's a really beneficial bite for the animals. A little bit about silver pasture. So silver pasture is the uh, intentional integration of livestock and trees. And this is Annie, um, who's one of our heifers. And actually, she was, um, her calf is standing the other side of her, and you can't see, can't see her there. And there's, I've actually got a photo of Annie when she was a tiny calf next to her mum, learning how to browse trees. And it was brilliant to see, you know, that after time passing that she was doing the same for her calf. Um, and this idea around silver pasture is that we are, stacking enterprises but we're which is a ridiculous way of saying that there's just more going on in one area of land and um, so not only do we have the open grassland but we've also got the trees obviously contributes to increase carbon stocks above and below ground increase carbon cycling increase biodiversity and biomass and it can be means that there's a reduced need again for bought in supplements again monitoring required um, trees that are high in tannin for example willow and oak um, although oak needs to be, have care taken with it because acorns can be poisonous, can mean that we don't need to use any anthelmintics. And if we're not using anthelmintics, we're not then contributing to the death of dung beetles and other dung dwellers. So making sure that our animals have access to trees as well as um, the sward, so the low level plants, is really, really important for them. In addition, um, and obviously having that um, reductions in, imp in inputs from uh, medication has a, has a knock-on effect in terms of you know, not having to bring inputs onto the farm. In terms of welfare, I cannot stress enough how amazing trees are for all animals. It's just the most wonderful thing to see, particularly cattle, browsing trees. They use them for shade, for shelter. There's that nutrient availability I've talked about. Their natural behaviors, and there's some brilliant research that was undertaken in South America that identified that there were more stable social hierarchies in animals that had access to trees than cows that had access just to grassland. And I think it's because the cows were able to kind of create distance between each other. They were able to use the trees to kind of hide behind a little bit. And so just having um, the ability to have wooded areas, if we ever have to integrate new animals into the herd, we would always do it in woodland because it just helps keep them nice and calm. Okay, and now a, 
adaptive multi-paddock grazing. So there was a question about holistic management and holistic planned grazing. What I would say is that holistic planned grazing doesn't say that you have to have high intensity of animals in a small area. What it says is that you need to move animals and create rest in the system. And holistic management actually drives you to decide what it is you're managing for. Um, and like Rebecca, we've undertaken our holistic management training, and so we've identified what our context is. And for us, it's abundance and diversity to nourish our community. So every grazing decision we make, every farm decision, every non-farm decision takes us back to those three key things, abundance, diversity, and nourishing people. And so when we are grazing the types of landscapes that we are in Upland Aberdeenshire, we don't have really high intensity grazing unless we're managing for a particular outcome on the ground that requires that. For example, some of our um, wader habitat would require a bit of um, kind of poaching, which is where the animals kind of make a bit of a mess on the ground because it helps the, the wader birds to, to, uh, in their feeding. But we're always making decisions about the stocking density, so the number of animals in a particular area for a particular time that reflects the needs of our holistic context. But that also includes ensuring that our animals are happy and healthy. So if it's a really hot day, we would never just have electric fence that was in the middle of the field without access to shade. And interestingly, actually, animals, even when given access to shade on a really hot day, often prioritize access to a breeze rather than shade. And it's really fascinating. And then there's people in this room that I know we've had this conversation in hot weather where it's not necessarily the shade that animals seek out, it is that breeze. So it's not thinking just about what would I as a human find beneficial, it's understanding and observing and reflecting that back in the decisions you make on farm. We also see that from using these adaptive um, multi-paddock grazing approaches, built, bringing rest into the system, that we're increasing the carrying capacity. If I hear one more presentation at this session, at this conference, telling me that agroecology reduces yields, I'm just going to scream because it isn't necessarily true. We have got fantastic research out there that is giving us the evidence that says the absolute opposite, that says you can increase yield um, from crops, you can increase the carrying capacity of the land, you can extend the grazing season. And I think we currently now, we heard about shifting baseline syndrome earlier from some folk. Um, we have forgotten how abundant our ecosystems can be. And I think that we don't realize just how much potential there is in our ecosystems. Right, I'm going off on one, so I'll, slow, I'll carry on and speed up and get through what I'm saying. Anyway, so frequent daily checking of the cattle means that we can check mobility, we can check behaviors, we can check dung, my favorite thing in the world, every single day, checking cow pats, really missing that, being away from home at the moment. Um, the perfect pat is a thing of beauty um, and would be deposited to the sound of a slow clap, like this, in case you're wondering. Um, it has a little dip with a slick in the middle. Anyway, um, so being able to check this, being able to monitor those things in terms of animal welfare means that we can be really present about what's going on for these animals. Are they getting what they need? Are they healthy? Do they need more of something or less of something else? And then I just want to finish talking about family groups. So most, um, you'll know from what Rebecca was talking about, dairy herds often calves are taken away um, within hours in some dairy systems. Um, for us, within a beef suckler herd, so that's where the cows and the calves are kept together, weaning occurs anywhere between sort of six to ten months. Um, we do not wean our calves. We keep all of our, in our home herd, we keep all of our livestock classes together. So cows, heifers, calves, steers, it's only the bull that is kept separate in his own little boy group. Um, and we don't wean the cows uh, we don't wean the calves at all, and what we see is natural weaning behavior happening at about 10 months. So in about March, the cows start kicking the calves off, and the calves start moving away from um, suckling and focusing entirely their diet on pasture alone. So, you know, deer do it. Why can't the cows do it? And I think we're too quick to intervene and try and control, and the minute we start intervening and controlling too much, we start creating problems that never existed, and then we need to find solutions that come at a cost to fix the problems that we've created because we didn't listen to nature. So, you know, I do feel that having these kind of mixed family groups in terms of sustainability means that we've got a reduced number of groups which can create more rest in the system, reduction in supplement, supplementary requirements, we're not having to give extra feed to calves, we're not having to move bales around using fossil fuel tractor um, requirements, anything like that. It's so much simpler and it is just so much more sustainable for us also financially 
And in terms of welfare, that maternal bond, the opportunities for learned behavior, particularly in terms of grazing and browsing, as I've already mentioned with Annie, learning from her mum and then teaching her calf, and this reduced stress of separation and maintaining herd dynamics means that the animals are much, much less stressed. And particularly, you know, a lot of, when, as we all know, when we're stressed and we find things difficult, our health tends to suffer. We're, we're run down, we pick up colds, we get a cough, we're not feeling great. Exactly the same for animals. If they're stressed, they're much more likely to have problems in their health as well, which is why health and welfare are kind of two sides of the same coin. They are, they are the same thing. So... That's, that's it from me. Um, I did just want to highlight that there's some brilliant research going on at the moment. I can't avoid talking about research as a researcher, um, but uh, particularly the Pathways project at the top and also the ReLivestock project. These are two big European projects that are looking at sustainable livestock and resilient livestock futures in the UK, uh, sorry, across Europe. And both of them take into account welfare, animal welfare as part of the life cycle analysis. So we recognize that historically there hasn't been the best research done that brings together environmental impact, sustainability, and health and welfare, but these two projects are starting to do that. Um, and we're also seeing through the SUSCAP project as well some great outputs. And I also wanted to highlight, if there's any vets in the room, um, this brilliant resource that Vet Sustain um, produced alongside um, myself and colleagues at Pasture for Life, which is a guide to, um, it's a support document basically for vets who are working with more um, agroecological or lower input farms um, because the ma majority of vet training is on fairly conventional farm systems and so it's an opportunity for them to start getting an insight into the types of farms that we've been talking about today. So I'm um, going to finish there and then I'm going to run over here and put my chair hat on and take some questions. Is that okay? Brilliant. Cool. All right. Bear with me. <laughs> <Thanks>. <coughs> Okay, so I think a question over here first, if that's all right, and then I'm going to take some online questions, and then we'll go over here. Thank you. Um, thanks, that was really interesting from all of you. Um, Nikki, I saw your talk in the Cheng building before this session, and you mentioned how all of your cattle have names, mm -hmm. and it makes it sometimes the culling process a bit hard. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and how you cope with having these animals that you care about so much and having to go through the process of culling them. Yeah, um, thank you. That's a, a brilliant question. It's also a hard question. Um, I firmly believe that we can respect and love and um, care for animals um, whilst recognizing that their role with us is functional. Um, and I think that's because I believe firmly that ecosystems are functional landscapes, they're functional systems, and we're part of that functional system. So, for example, the animals that we have have a function of providing food, but their primary function is biodiversity and abundance. And so I think once you go into it with that mindset that I can appreciate, care for, and love that individual animal, I also recognize that they're part of a herd that is undertaking a function within that landscape, and that there will be a point at which that animal is, um, is not suitable either, uh, may, not be, may not be suitable because um, their, their health and welfare is struggling in our system because we apply high selection pressure, or it's the point at which they are ready to go to slaughter. Um, and yeah, it's hard. I guess it's a kind of a recognition and a respect um, for the animal. And I totally get that there will be people who just can't grasp that and I'm really not very good at articulating it, and it's something I maybe need to get better at articulating. When that meat, we all, for every animal that we slaughter, we always keep some of the meat back for ourselves, even if it's just a steak. And when we eat that, we have a bit of a moment of thank you to that animal. Um, and for us, that's a really important thing to do. And I totally accept that there'll be lots of farmers that either don't have time for that, or for them, they can't eat their own animals. For us, it's a case of recognizing the reciprocity of the system. We cared for the animal, the animal helped us to do the job that we do, the animal is nourishing us, hopefully we've nourished that animal in the time that it's been with us. Um, I think there was a question down here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I think there's a lady in orange. If everyone could wear bright colors to these events, it's very helpful so that we can see. Uh, I, I can't think how to improve on your system, but I was just wondering, what do you do about horns? 
about horns and cattle yeah they just have them you leave them on yeah 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 sorry i didn't know if it was obvious from the photos maybe i didn't put many pictures yeah so we we run a mixed herd of horned and polled cattle naturally polled so our cattle are shetlands um, we also have Galloways, and we've also just brought in some native Angus into the, into the herd, um, and we just run a mixed herd, and it's fine. Like, people say you can't run them together, and yes, you can, and there's... I've taken a lot of heat on social media about kind of, you know, being near animals with horns and kind of being told that I'm irresponsible, and, and actually, I mean, it just... Yeah, we, I, I was talking to someone today about, you know, watching a horned animal walk through a space that their horns don't fit in, and the animals are really conscious of where their horns are. They use them as a tool. Hilarious watching cars with little stubby horns use them as back scratches like this. It's just, yeah, I mean, we, I just don't worry about it. And we're not biodynamic, so. What about your not. cows? You're dehorning yeah. them? Uh, so, with our, our breeding for the jerseys, we're trying to go down the naturally polled route, or we do disbud if we, you know, if, if, I, if there's something else in the selection process for AI that means I really want to go for that particular genetic pool, then we disbud. Um, very, very early on. Um, in the beef herd, we've got a mixture of horned and non-horned. Um, some individuals are nice and polite and some are not. Um, and the ones that are not polite, um, I will be more, well, less sad when they leave. But on, on the whole, I think you need to have a little bit of a balance, some with horns, enough so that you can kind of rough and tumble together. They're very different. Um, but it's an individual um, animal issue rather, I think, than a herd issue with horns. Mark, I think this is an important Mark's. point. Well done for bringing mm. it up. And yeah. the other thing is castrating. Yeah. You know, why do you take on board the idea that you can castrate whenever you want? Um, and I think that's the whole point of this problem of, of making a difference between the individual and, and the conservation of wildlife. It's are these sort of questions, and you have to address them by saying, well, in the case of this individual, what is going to be the best thing for him or her? Um, we've tried experimentally not to dehorn animals that were kept or could come inside during the, during the um, winter. Now, obviously, you don't want bigger and bigger and bigger buildings so that everyone has tons of space, because that environmentally is not an acceptable thing. So what do you do? do, you, do you, are they slightly crushed when they come in? In which case, if they have horns, they probably will horn each other. Um, and so, you know, it's a question of how you're going to keep them and how you're going to manage them and whether or not you think for that individual it might be a good idea if I dehorn. But it certainly shouldn't, or castrate, but it certainly shouldn't go without question. Mm. Well, it's it's just the, um, the intensive units. It's just that I know that they disbud, and it's up to the farmer whether they anaesthetize them or not. It's not a law, is it? It kind of should be, I think. No, I don't, it's, it's not a law. It would be best practice. It is in um, France. You're not allowed to debud in mm, France. Mm. I don't know anyone who disbuds without an, an anesthetic. Yeah. No, but they're... They could be, couldn't they? That's no, the thing. That is true. But there are lots of alternatives now to um, actually having to, to manually disbud. Some of these creams actually are quite good when they're used, yeah, yeah, the paste yeah. used properly. Um, so there are other options now. Um, I'm going to move us on to some of the questions from online, and then we will come to the question at the back. But question online was um, for Marta. Uh, sorry, Mart. What is your opinion on the vegan narrative? Do you think it is the future for climate-aligned farming or damaging to the sector when mammals are so vital to a balanced ecosystem? I think there's a, rule for, uh, there's, there's a role for veganism. I mean, I think if we went back to that question of if you feel it's really, really bad news to kill an animal, um, you might say, well, I'll go vegan. But if everyone went vegan, we're going to have a real problem with biodiversity. And we're going, to, we're going to lose animals, like no tomorrow. And should we? Um, you know, uh, my, my theory, uh, not theory, my practice is that, that we can learn from all, having all these animals around, and they can learn from us. And it's part of our heritage to live with them and by them. And we are reduced in who we are by not having animals around us. 
So this veganism lark is all very well for those who are totally anthropocentric and only want to live in an, a human environment, which is a place for it, I think, in big cities and so on. But it's not going to be a world solution. Mart, I love what you just said. We are reduced in who we are without animals around mm. us. That, you like, win the conference with that line. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that. Um, OK, I've got a second. That was the most upvoted question. So thank you very much for answering that. I think that was a, a brilliant answer. The second most voted question, oh, hang on, it's gone, was animal welfare should include slaughter considerations, yet the majority of pigs in the UK are killed by gassing, clearly inhumane and hidden from the public. How can it be changed? Should slaughter methods be stated on packaging, Rebecca? Yes. Gosh, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, definitely, completely agree with that. Um, my reply would be that, well, the labels are going to have to get an awful lot bigger because if we're going to put that on there, then we need a whole load of other things as well. Um, you know, method of production, what the animals eaten, what drugs have been administered, the crops that they've eaten, what, what have they had put on them. So this label's going to be about five foot tall. Um, but it's a really, really important consideration. Um, and the other thing to think of is... Is, is ways that we can improve slaughterhouses for, for animals in general. I mean, not everyone wants to home slaughter, not everyone can home slaughter, but that is another question itself. Why not? Why shouldn't we have more mobile um, slaughtering facilities? Um, I know I it's, yeah, absolutely. Um, I do think that we have this extraordinary irrationality amongst humans that somehow it's perfectly all right for if you are a certain type of religious maniac or believer, uh, it's, you, can, you don't have to uh, make the animal unconscious before you, so slaughter it. Now, that is indicating that humans can rule, okay, and that animals' feelings don't count at all. And we really need to get out of that hole we've fallen into and say, well, if you believe that the animal must be um, unconscious, uh, conscious when you kill it, then you better either shoot it out there in the wild, and if you can't find them to do that, then you better not eat meat. Because there's absolutely no reason why the animal should not be pre-stunned before it is killed. And it can be easily done, and now we have quite a lot of information from a whole lot of people, ethologists, who've been working on abattoirs of how to allow animals to go through into abattoirs to be pre-stunned without distress or predictions going on in their brains. And we can do it, but we're not doing it. And, and I think it's just outrageous the way that religious groups are allowed to get away with this kind of thing. It, it doesn't add up. I'm not against any religious group. I think um, it's really interesting, the, the, the question about labelling. Um, and I think if any of you are interested in how we better reflect um, the method of production and potential slaughter, then do have a look at the clear labelling campaign. Mm. So C-L-E-A-R labelling. Um, you can find them online. Um, and it's a campaign that is being... Well, it was originally kind of started by... Um, uh, Fidelity Weston, who was chair of Pasture for Life um, and supported by many other organizations, including lots of other environmental and farming uh, NGOs who are looking at how we can better ensure that consumers can make informed decisions because their food is appropriately labeled. Um, I'm going to move us on just because we have got seven minutes left and there's loads of other questions. There was a question at the back of the room, I think. Could we maybe take that question? Sorry, I should have given more warning. <laughs> um, right at the back left. Uh, my, your left, my right corner. One, two, three, four. Thank you. Um, yeah, Amber here. I thank you so much for all of your presentations. Uh, super informative. Um, I guess it's a question maybe for Rebecca to do, go back to poultry and to talk a little bit about avian influenza. Um, and I just wondered whether you had any comments on how the house, current housing mandate and moving your chickens indoors um, has affected the economics of your business um, and how you see the future panning out for poultry in part of your mixed system, um, especially if avian influenza is going to continue the way that it, it has been the last couple of years. Yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, it's a very good question, and it's, it's a really difficult subject. We've been hoping for the last couple of years to extend our pastured poultry flock to include birds for meat as well. Um, obviously, with the, the flock downs that we've had, and Norfolk's been really badly hit um, this year, but that is because um, all, of, all the words birds migrate into Norfolk first. So it's actually really quiet in Norfolk now, and it's spread over the rest of the country, but we were hit very hard um, early on. Um, so we haven't progressed with our pastured poultry business for meat um, yet as such. I mean, the chickens are miserable. I think I alluded to that earlier. Um, that's not what I went into uh, chickens for egg production to do. And we only have 300. So we, we don't have 15,000 birds to worry about. Thank God. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want it. Not, not with the, the flock down that's going on at the minute and, and the pressure. Um, so I think the, the feed bill's probably gone up by about 20 to 30%. Um, and because they're soya free, that's an awful lot of extra food. We're trying to make them eat the, the proper chicken formulated ration first before we then give treats in the afternoon because you don't want egg production to dip too much, which it has. Um, we have been having the conversation because we have such high demand for our soya free eggs that we could at least double our flock. Um, we've been lucky because we sell direct that we've put our egg price up and people are completely understanding about it. Um, but there are no eggs on the shelves in the supermarkets in places at times. So it's a really difficult one. What are we going to do when we need to increase the, the chicken flock? Well, probably polytunnels might be an answer for us. At least it'll be a nicer environment. Um, but we haven't fully, fully covered that one yet. But it's, it's really expensive. It's, it's not nice for the chickens. And there is no clear-cut answer other than someone threatened... Um, chicken vaccinations with lots of gene editing in the other day and I won't repeat my response because it wasn't very polite. Um, we've got a question uh, I think just here. I think it's lady with purple hair. Yes. Thank you. Uh, hi. Um, I'm also rare breed poultry and sheep and don't even start talking to me about bird flu because it's just a nightmare. But I just had some other questions, welfare questions, cause, but you've actually covered one of them which was the small abattoir question because I have a small abattoir or I did have one 30 minutes from the house which closed down and and that's a an issue I think that we need to look at because the more small ones close we've got a welfare issue then with transporting animals further and it does feel like the small producers like me are being almost squeezed by the small abattoirs closing and and re, um, legislation on that so I'm hoping I know Pasture for Life have got um, some input in that as well um, and you were also talking about um, someone asked a question about how you can sort of send something to slaughter that you've given a name to but I, the way I look at it is they only have one bad day on my farm and um, if you kind of look at it that way that you've, you've really given them a good quality of life then that bad well that bad day kind of seems to be a bit less but then um, the question that I've got that no one's touched on is the idea of necessary mutilations that we do so I mean I breed sheep and the castrations and the tails and the fact that we you know we do the rubber band and it seems to be okay um, in the mainstream sheep world, that, that a lamb will lie on the floor writhing for 30 minutes before it stands up, gives itself a shake and get going. And for me, that's not acceptable. So I use a small amount of local anaesthetic. It takes me a little bit longer, but the lambs get up and they walk off. Mm. And um, there's lots of things like ear tagging and stuff like that in, in farming. And I think there's something that possibly we need to look at, but we need it, obviously, the tagging as a management role. Yep. But there are other things that we, that we carry out which have become run of the mill and I feel that, you know, and, and the people will start saying, well, it'll take me too long to do it that way. But we perhaps need to spend an extra two minutes putting a bit of lidocaine um, into some cords before we stick a rubber band on them. Because 50% of this room probably wouldn't like that to happen without of it. So um, that's something I just thought we might like to... I, th I, think, that's, I think that's a really, a really good point. Um, and it's interesting, you know, again, kind of with, with my Pasture for Life hat on, we do have guidance within our standards uh, framework, with our certification standards, that relates to mutilation. So we're very clear about that, as would organic um, certification standards be as well. Um, and I'm going to come to Mark in a second, because I know that there's probably things that you want to, to say about, about, about that. From, in our system, if we didn't have to ear tag, we wouldn't. Um, we uh, only castrate... Uh, we castrate at um, sort of six to seven months old um, and we have the vet out and they have anaesthetic and it's, yeah, it's very much a, um, a process where we are quite happy to spend as much as we need to financially 
to in order that the animal goes through as little stress as possible, it's still a horrible experience and something that we absolutely would, uh, uh, we're trying to think of ways that we can avoid doing that. Um, it would mean um, keeping mums and bull calves separate from the rest of the herd. Our Shetland start cycling, our Shetland cattle start cycling at four months old. So yeah, there's all sorts of issues. We've got a minute left. I'm having a sign waved at me. Mark, did you want to say anything about... Well, I couldn't really hear the question. It was about mutilations and about how basically within farming, we're kind of all okay with the fact that lots yeah. of mutilations... No, I think, I agree. I think we've got to look very carefully at whether or not we should do these mutilations. And I would go back to your castration thing. It's quite possible not to castrate mm. young bulls. It just means you're going to have to change your change structure a little. Yeah. They all, cattle live in multi-male groups. Yes. So they're not going to, unlike uh, horses, if you were to keep a whole bunch of entire males with a bunch of mares, you would end up with a lot of trouble. Yes. With cattle, you don't, and neither do you with sheep. So it's quite possible by changing your management not to castrate. And then you have the added advantage of having about 17% extra growth from testosterone. And um, you have bull beef. Amazing. I'm going to stop us there because we're <laughs> at time. Thank you so much. Can you join me in thanking my colleagues up here? Amazing job. <laughs> There were lots of hands coming up, so we'll hang around here for a little bit. And if you want to come and ask specific questions, please do. Thank you very much to our online audience as well. Thank you ever so much for coming to listen. Thank you.